Dozens of Northeastern students were in court today after police arrested another 100 or so protesters and broke up the pro-Palestine encampment at the school over the weekend. That was a week after police arrested 100 protesters at Emerson College and shut down the encampment there. Protesters are still camped out at Harvard and Tufts as students across the country call on their colleges and universities to divest from Israel over the war in Gaza. Are their voices being heard, though? I'm joined now by Emily Spetz. She is campus editor for Northeastern's student newspaper, The Huntington News, and Marjorie Feld, a history professor at Babson College and the author of the forthcoming book, The Threshold of Dissent, a history of American Jewish critics of Zionism. Thank you both for being here. Thank you for having us. So, Emily, Thank you know, you. I'll start with you because we have been talking about how these student journals are really how we understand what is happening because you're there places like harvard they're cut off from the public and and other journalists so what has it been like watching this unfold on campus yeah i would say it's definitely been hard i think as um, student journalists in the first place because this is the first time a lot of us have covered anything like this um, i think we did live updates and doing something like that so fast-paced and having to keep up with social media and um, you know just everything going on on the ground was difficult and also um, a lot of our staff had gone home for the summer, so we were pretty short-staffed. So um, it was dealing with a lot of exhaustion and just working overtime. Um, I think also we were having problems getting students to talk to us um, and just trying to keep up a good relationship, a good trusting relationships, relationship with the students that um, were organizing and protesting. Um, and also just trying to be fair and complete and correct in our coverage. Um, but. I am really proud of the work that we did, and everyone really came together, so, yeah. Does it feel like the campus is divided over this issue in a way that you may not have seen before have, or have seen before? Yeah, I will say that um, I've been campus editor for since January, so, um, and then deputy campus before that, so I've seen kind of campus the entire time during mm. um, the war since October, and I think we have been pretty divided since the start. Um, even at uh, this encampment on Friday, we had pro-Israel pro protesters show up and there were some very tense um, confrontations between them. Um, so yeah, it definitely feels like campus is divided. There's Jewish people saying that they feel threatened um, by the chants and the protest. Um, and there's pro-Palestine students saying that they don't feel heard by the university and also feel threatened and feel like there's Islamophobia on campus. Yeah. Marjorie, I want to ask you, you know, I think that this conflict has really not only split up campuses, but also folks in, in the Jewish American communities. And you have been writing up uh, on this sort of conflict for, for many years now. I have. I, I began the book um, seven or eight years ago. It was a book that was delayed by COVID, but I had no, I just couldn't have imagined that it would um, be published in a climate like this one, which is such a chilly climate with regard to issues of dissent. So it's, it's a little harrowing, actually, to be a witness to this. And I would just say, you know, gently that um, there are Jewish students on all sides of this issue. So um, we can't predict based on ethnicity, religion, or culture where someone falls. And I also would encourage us to think that there are more than just two sides. I think that people feel very conflicted and are internalizing a lot of the tension that she's writing about, that Emily's writing about. Yeah, you mentioned that you actually have been, you began this book seven or eight years ago when the events happened in October. I mean, as you, I don't know, maybe we're doing a last edit or we're ready to push it out. I mean, what went through your mind? Well, so the book was to be released um, and I was to be doing final edits then. They asked me to write a new end of the book after the elections of our of uh, fall 2022. So that was when a lot of American Jews were really dissenting from Netanyahu, Prime Minister Netanyahu's cabinet in Israel, and closing down American Jewish institutions to those far right cabinet members. Then the um, October events happened, the brutal attack of Hamas on Israeli citizens. And as a result of that, they asked me to write a second coda to it. So it's really been um, a difficult and fraught experience, putting the book out into the world, but also witnessing what's going on right now among American Jews and, um, and the courageous protesters on our college campuses at the same time. I also think about the 
history is so complex in that region and so many people including the young people who are on campuses are entering into it after, you know post october whereas there's so much history happening before that that needs to be understood as well um how do you think that plays a role in the in sort of the emotion behind this and, and maybe some of the actions it's a terrific question. I think that for a long time, and this is one of the things that I try and others try to chronicle, um, any invocation of the history of Palestine or Palestinians has been really um, seen as a fraught thing to teach about or even to talk about in institutions of learning, higher ed and on down. Uh, so that's especially true within the American Jewish community, I think, where for reasons of Jewish safety, American Jews were not really supposed to talk about or teach about or learn about the history of the Nakba or Palestinian oppression at the hands of Israel. So the students who are protesting right now are kind of a logical evolution of this and their demands are quite forthright. Right? They really want access to that history and they want to teach about that history and a lot of them are doing that and mostly peacefully. Emily, do you find that your peers or the folks you're interviewing are, are learning as they are protesting or gathering um, and becoming activated around this issue since October. Yeah, I definitely think so. I think the encampment really showed me that even more uh, because there was such a community and people were, I saw people reading all kinds of political books and kind of teaching each other. There was speakers from outside organizations coming to speak. Um, I've heard some people say that they um, heard conversations among demonstrators about just, you know, telling each other what they had learned in the books they're reading. Um, so, yeah, I definitely think that there has been a lot of learning about not even just how to demonstrate, because I've heard, you know, the students that were arrested today talking about how they've learned how to demonstrate during this time. Um, but, yeah, also a lot of learning about history and um, and yeah, the conflict overall. Yeah, I under, you know, we when we are looking at your reporting and the pointing of the the reporting of the huntington you know it talked about the first day of the encampment things were really really intense yeah definitely um that first day was definitely intense i think um police was present even before the encampment started mm. um it started at 8 a.m and then at about 2 p.m we had boston police show up in ride gear and they stood on Centennial Common for about 30 minute, minutes and then they ended up leaving. Um, so that was like a really interesting moment. Um, and then later we had students from Berkeley College of Music and um, Boston University join our encampment. Um, so yeah, it was, it was pretty intense and there's a lot of moments throughout, you know, the, some 48 hours that people were um, camping out that were very tense, but also, you know, very peaceful and communal. The timing is interesting because we know that, you know, it's the final days of classes. I, you know, I teach at Northeastern, in full disclosure, and I had to submit my grades today. So what happens next? I know that Huskies for Palestine say that they're not done advocating, that they're going to stay out there. But is this something that we anticipate folks to continue past classes being over? Um, I think so. I think Northeastern especially has a pretty strong um, I guess, culture of taking summer classes or staying for a co-op. Um, so yeah, I think definitely we're going to see more action at Northeastern specifically. Um, and yeah, I've definitely heard from people that, um, you know, this isn't over. People are going to be fighting for Northeastern to drop the disciplinary charges against students. Um, and, you know, continuing, even if not through the summer, I think next semester we're going to see a lot more of it. Yeah. yeah. Marjorie, you know, I know you, you have been writing uh, on these, these conflicts on college campuses before. We saw the actions at, at Columbia University, of course, in New York, Emerson with, with Mayor Wu's decision to send Boston police there to break up those encampments and, and the actions on other. Like, what do you make of the response that is happening on college campuses, which are kind of known as these places where students get act, learn about new things or, or get acti activated around events that are happening in the world and colleges, you know, have to sort of deal with it. And now you're seeing this sort of aggressive response to breaking down or shutting down these, these uh, uh, protests or encampments. Right. I mean, there are, there are a bunch of ways we can look at it yeah. from a historical perspective. We can think about all the student movements on college campuses, like the anti-Vietnam movement, the anti-apartheid movement, 
in all of these situations and contexts, students were leading the way, right? Um, imbibing the messages of anti-colonialism and communicating to the public the urgency of the issue. So institutions of higher learning are supposed to be places where uh, people learn, students learn, and um, there's been a curtailing of their ability to talk and learn about these issues. So it's, it's to their credit that they're creating these learning communities when they're peaceful. Um, I would also say, I think it's we have to be really vigilant in differentiating between when we're feeling uncomfortable with knowledge that might challenge the way we understand things and when there's actual physical danger, nobody should have to be should have to feel unsafe uh, in any place of learning ever. Any kind of hate speech should be condemned and um, you know made to go away. At the same time, I think that a lot of these lessons that they're teaching us, these students, um, make people feel uncomfortable, and it's good to lean into that discomfort and um, figure out what we can do, as Emily was saying so well, right, to, to keep this momentum going, to keep the learning happening. And I would, if I can, I would just add that the, the Passover Seder happened on a bunch of these mm -hmm. college campuses. So there's this Jewish holiday of liberation that um, a lot of the Jews on these and, and their broader coalitions on these campuses have uh, engaged in this ritual, which is a sort of a reclaiming of Jewish traditions of justice and liberation. So all of these, I think, are, are vantage points from which we can view what's going on on campuses right now. And there's reason for optimism, um, even as we fear for some of the police response. Yeah, and this is not the first time that students on college campuses have been activated around a conflict that has happened in that region. No, to be sure. Yeah. I think that we've seen protests in previous, previous chapters of these protests um, with what's going on in the Middle East. There's much we can learn from them, and I think there's, it appears that we've reached a sort of a low point of what I call the threshold of dissent, mm. and that is accompanied by a really sort of hopeful moment where people are demanding access to this information and this history so that they come to understand all the, the conflicts that might follow from a more informed perspective, which I really respect. Yeah, Emily, I'm thoughtful about as you report on this, you must be learning so much about this particular issue yourself and, and have questions around, you know, the learning, like the, this conflict, but other conflicts that you may have to report on later on. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think it's definitely been difficult considering the history and kind of like the divisions and what people think about the history and kind of this conflict overall. Um, and it's been difficult, I guess, to kind of um, gauge, I guess, where, what we should cover and what we yeah. shouldn't, because I think as journalists, we have a responsibility to give context um, to a conflict. Um, but I think that it's kind of impossible in some ways to give all the context in every single story. So it's kind of been like a, a battle for me personally of um, how much do I, how much do I, how much history and how much, um, how much, I guess, I don't know, like nuance do I put into my articles um, with a limited amount of words. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I imagine, you know, it, it's something that you're going to have to be thinking about for some time soon since this is what apparently folks have vowed to continue. Uh, Emily and Marjorie, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you.